and it's a beautifully well written piece that's actually in a different voice and uh, it really encapsulates it for the young adults and the readers out there and teenagers as well. And beautiful August edition as well as a children's picture book which is all through Gobi's eyes and it's her journey in the desert and why she chose me and what she was doing out there and all those unanswered questions and some of the drawings in here are absolutely beautiful as well and this is, uh, this is an incredible piece of work this and it's brought a tear to us putting this one together as well. So uh, we thank everyone that supported us through the whole journey of bringing Gobi home and uh, you'll really enjoy our book Finding Gobi and uh, thank you so much for everything. I know that some of you have sent in some questions today so are really keen to answer as many of those as possible. And the first one is Nancy asked, what does it take to mentally and physically run something like the Gobi Desert? And it's a great question because uh, you would think that it's mainly physically that you need to get through these races and it is something that actually does take a lot of physical en energy to get through and I need to train and I'm doing around 100 miles a week training to prepare for these races. But what actually happens is these races go on for six stages and seven days. You're running on limited food, limited water. You don't get very much sleep at night as well. So you actually need to start using the mental capacity to drive you further to complete these races. And that really becomes a mental drain on you. I actually use a lot of negative energy and the things I spoke about earlier, the things that happened in my life to drive me to be a better person and a better runner and try and compete to win the race. And I think Gobi really caught me in that stage of being in a real mental downer um, that I felt very sorry for her and I felt sorry for myself in some respects seeing her in that um, and that's why I decided to be the person to look after her. So I guess in answer to your question, you know, it is a real mental push more than a physical but finishing the races across the desert in, in any capacity whether it's a 155 mile race or whether you're doing a marathon, a half marathon or a 5k on a sad day is just truly, uh, truly amazing. The, the second question is recap your story with Gobi and uh, the, apparently the sound was down on that so I'll just repeat that for those of you that don't know. It's, uh, I was running a 155 mile, six stage, seven day race across the Gobi Desert and Gobi would join me on day two of the race. Uh, this little incredible dog would form a bond with me and I would eventually form a bond with her and uh, she would run 77 miles of the race so she would run half of the race. Our bond was inseparable and during the race I would actually make some decisions to sacrifice winning the race to help her to get her through some really tough challenging situations going across river crossings she couldn't cross her own, through bridge gate crossings she couldn't cross on her own and through some of the toughest and hottest terrain in the world. She would actually become so important to me that I would make a decision and a promise through the race to bring her back to the UK and uh, that was really the incredible start of our journey together. John asks, do you remember the moment you saw Gobi? Did you think she'd run as long as she did with you? Uh, no, John, and uh, I, I remember it, of course, but I didn't think she would run so far with me on stage two. I actually saw her on the evening of stage one and I'd finished the race in third position, had a really good day. I was concentrating on preparing for the next day's racing. I was eating my food and I was prepping for that and I actually noticed this little dog walking around the campfire getting food from people and I thought that's a cute little dog that's a pretty smart little dog as well and there's no way I was going to feed it you know as I said earlier you've got to carry all of your food and kit to survive the week as well so giving away your food and kit is something that you wouldn't do uh, lightly but obviously Gobi didn't have any food so we all had to chip in and everyone in the race actually helped her uh, it was uh, amazing to see her run with me through that stage on the second day across the Tian Shan mountain range. Uh, she would run nearly a, a marathon in distance but also a huge distance in height and uh, it was just incredible. It was tough enough for humans to do it but for this little dog to do it as well was inspirational. Chris asks, was there a moment when you felt a real bond with Gobi? Well that actually happened on stage three as I mentioned, uh, crossing the rivers with uh, Gobi and making those decisions to sacrifice the race. But then at the end of the evenings when she would curl up in my arms, that was just 
uh, beautiful to see her. She would drift off to sleep and I would actually look at her as she was in my arms and I would think, I wonder if she's got any diseases. I couldn't think if I'd had my rabies shots and she was smelly and she really had the worst fur in the world and there was things, you know, that uh, I was worried about her sort of health and well-being and she would just do anything to be with me and that really made me think to her, to myself this was more than just a, a man meets dog situation and our book Finding Gobi really goes into that uh, in more detail about this special bond and how it was formed and why we did uh, the things that we did together and it was just so beautiful to see her waiting for me also on two of the stages stage four and stage five of the race where she couldn't run the race because of extreme heat and conditions she would wait at the finish line for me and be sitting there and as soon as she would see me bounding in with my bright yellow shirt, she would come out and she would join me and she would run in with me like she'd run the stage with me. And I would speak to the people at the, the final finish point there doing the timings and they would say, she's been waiting here all day for you. And uh, they said she just wouldn't leave the spot. She just knew I would come by. Gina asks, hi Gina, uh, was there a moment when you thought you wouldn't find Gobi? Uh, that moment happened as soon as I flew into Urumqi. Uh, I could see how big the city was and whilst I passed through the city on my travels to the race, I actually hadn't spent that much time there. I didn't like the city, I knew that already from those travel moments and uh, I knew it was going to be a really tough situation to do it and it was the most saddest, depressing uh, part of the, the time looking for her was actually in the evenings when I would reflect on the great relationship we'd formed during the race and then realise that there were so many stray dogs on the street and it was so sad to see all of these stray dogs in need and to know that Gobi was one of these many, many thousands and thousands of stray dogs that wouldn't be, would be looking for food, would be looking for warmth and would be looking for shelter and I, I felt that I'd let her down and I was really disappointed with myself and of course you look back in hindsight and think that the decisions that you'd made could have been different to ensure that she was better looked after but we found her and uh, it was a roller coaster ride and uh, there were so many people looking for her, it was incredible but there were so many things happening that was really also making the decision, making the finding her even more incredibly difficult because we had threats against her life, we had ransom notes, we had people saying that uh, they had Gobi and all of these things were making it even more difficult to really believe that we would find her. Dan asks, what was it like reuniting with Gobi? Uh, that was one of the best moments of my life and it was one of the best days ever that I didn't think would ever happen and walking into this room and seeing Gobi for the first time in my time back in Urumqi and realising it was really her was was unbelievable and, and how she was found and the, the story around that is also incredible as well. Erin asks, do you still run with Gobi at home? Has she joined you on any more races? Uh, Gobi's desert days are over so there'll be no more multi-stage races for her. As you can see she loves chilling out and uh, if we were to get up and walk outside on the street now, she gets back into the energy and she wants to be running and skipping alongside me as we were in the Gobi Desert. Uh, as long as she's beside me, she's happy and uh, we don't run so much anymore. Gobi had some horrific injuries to her and uh, when we found her in Urumqi, so those needed to be dealt with and uh, they were caused from a wide range of things and uh, it was also became a very sad moment to see that Gobi was such bad shape but she's recovering really well now and we'll look to do some races perhaps later in the year and we're looking at an initiative back in Edinburgh in Scotland where we're going to run together to raise some money for shelters there as well. Ben asks why do you think Gobi chose you? Uh, that's probably the best question ever Ben and the question I get asked always and the thing that I think about every day I don't I don't know the answer and I wish I did know uh, why me, what was the reasoning and uh, why did she continue to as well and we talk about this in the book a lot and uh, there is there is definitely more to it than just a man meets dog situation and there was so much sort of happening along the, along the race as well that she could have peeled off and, and gone in a different direction but she, she just didn't want to, she wanted to stay with me and sometimes walking her down in the park in Edinburgh a little leaf will go by and she will run off and that will be her gone and I'll have to 
go and get her and bring her back. And it just makes me realize like how amazing it was that she went through 77 miles and still stayed with us. Okay, so this is the last question from Sarah. Hi Sarah, what do you think people can learn about your story with Gobi? Well, I think there's so much sad and bad news and uh, so many things happening in the world at the moment that it's been so heartwarming and inspiring to see people come together from all around the world to support Gobi and myself with this story. It's such a heartwarming, uh, uplifting story. It's so inspirational and I just think you will see this and you will be able to have a it's a great summer read you will love it and you'll put a smile on your face and it will make you forget about all of the things that you don't want to switch the news on for and uh, you know the the people that have read it already in the markets that has been released have just been like wow this story has been so incredible I haven't been able to put it down I've read it in a day and uh, we really hope that you feel the same and we thank you all for supporting us and our journey and following us and uh, you can continue to follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Finding Gobi as well and we're also at www.findinggobi.com. Thank you so much guys and it's been a pleasure to be here with you today.